as you can see from that picture up there, there's a picture of bars of a window. Of course, when the Apostle Paul was in prison, he was in prison in a Roman dungeon with no windows. He was behind bars, and he wrote this in about 60 AD. And the Apostle Paul was far from being in perfect conditions. In fact, it was a horrible situation. This is the second imprisonment. The first one was under house arrest. This one was underneath the ground. He was chained more likely to a Roman guard. And he didn't have all the amenities they have in prison today. No, no three hots and a cot, as uh, people like to affectionately say today. It was a difficult set of circumstances for him to be in. In fact, the Apostle Paul's dream was to go to Rome and speak and share the gospel. He even wrote a tremendous book called Romans in preparation for that. Yet he never really had a chance to go to Rome in the way he would probably have hoped to go. Instead, he's a prisoner. And when you find the Apostle Paul, I'm just going to give a little bit of a summary of last week. When you find the Apostle Paul, he is a prisoner. He's even beginning to wonder if anyone's left that he calls faithful. He's very, a lot of the people that said, I'm with you, the Apostle Paul, abandoned him. And so it was not an easy time. In fact, at any moment, his head could be chopped off. One of the privileges that the Apostle Paul had, he was a Roman citizen by buying it. And one of the great things about being a Roman citizen, you can't be crucified, but you can get your head lopped off. So what a, what a deal, huh? So it was not a pretty set of circumstances. In addition to that, he planted churches, and there was heresies. What is a heresy? Heresies taking the truth that, that you know and twisting it upside down. There are things that he started a church. Imagine you start a business and someone takes it over and starts using it in a harmful way. Well, he had that going on. A bunch of churches he started were running in the wrong way because people were taking advantage of people. So he had a lot of difficulties. And how many of us today maybe have a situation like that? Maybe you raised some children and now they're running away in the wrong way. You're like, God, what am I supposed to do with these people? Maybe it's a situation with your family that's not going the way you'd want it to go. Maybe a situation with your spouse or maybe you're, you're suffering from a physical condition or whatever. And you, things are not as what you've hoped it to be. In fact, it's far from a storybook. It's more like a horror story. It, life is difficult. And the Apostle Paul was going through that. And we mentioned last week the major a premise of last week's message. By the way, please go ahead if you want to catch up. I'm not going to re-preach it, but go to cornerstonecheshire.com and you can click on the media and hit last week's sermon. Uh, joy no matter what, week one. Joy is a choice. My friends, joy is a choice. We mentioned last week as well that happiness is based on happenstance. Happiness is what happens to you. Joy is something you choose. Joy is beyond circumstance. Joy sets beyond that. While happiness is based upon what's going around in the circle of your circumstances, while joy is ahead of you, joy is something else. And so we mentioned that last week, that joy is a choice that you and I have to make. And the Bible says, and, and also in Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And the Apostle Paul is basically telling us, listen guys, I want you to rejoice, and he's not saying it like, hey, if you get around, he's saying it as a command. He says, I want you to rejoice. It's in the imperative form in the, in the grammar. It's not just, it says rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. And here's a guy, and I'm so glad, by the way, the Apostle Paul said, and not just me, because if anyone had any authority to speak about this, it would be the Apostle Paul, who was under great duress. I don't think anyone in this place today has a situation where your friends are being martyred, that you're thrown in prison, I don't think any of us have been beaten with rods and shipwrecked twice, bitten by a snake. I don't think any of us in this place have been stoned with rocks. Maybe the other way, but not, not rocks. Okay, none of us has experienced that and been through all that. And so this gentleman, the Apostle Paul, has, a, has authority to speak about this because he's lived through difficult sets of circumstances and he's come on top. And he says joy over 16 times in this little book. So today, we continue uh, with it today. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. Today's title is simply this, Christ's attitude will bring you to God's altitude. Christ's attitude will bring you to God's altitude. What is that supposed to mean? Well, we're going to look at it in a few seconds. I'm going to go right ahead and jump a little bit ahead to chapter 2, and then we're going to go back and look at it again. He says also in, in Philippians 2, verse 5, says this, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What it says in different translations, it says, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The basic essence of how to find joy is to find the secret of what Christ has done. 
Okay, what Jesus has done is he came to earth to show us the way. Now, how are we supposed to find joy no matter what? Well, Christ's attitude is the answer. We're going to look at that in a few moments. Before we do that, though, I want to go back a little bit. We weren't able to complete chapter 1. I want to go through chapter 1 just a little bit. So please bring your Bibles. We're going through the book of Philippians. We encourage you to read it at home. It's, it's about uh, two pages in most books. It takes about 20 minutes to read. We want to encourage you to read it. And so I'm going to go ahead and read a little bit to you. Um, <clears throat> here it is. Philippians 1, starting at verse 20, to catch up from last week. According to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing shall I be ashamed. But with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Now here's a very famous passage of scripture. You've probably heard this verse at one time or another if you've been to church for a number of years. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now what is the Apostle Paul saying here? He's basically saying if I'm alive, it's a lie to be in Christ and to be dead is gain. Now he's not a Christian suicidal thought. He's not hoping one day that a bus hits him and he goes to heaven because life's tough. Maybe you've been through that situation. God, I, you know, if you want to take me right now, God, I know when I had a stomach virus, I'm like, God, just take me home now. My wife's, you wimp. But anyhow, she didn't say that to me. But, you know, when you go through a difficult time, like, God, just take me home now. This is too difficult for me. And the Apostle Paul, that's not what he's talking about. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So uh, while I'm here on the planet, I'm going to give God everything I have. And if they kill me, I'm better off. And he has joy in the midst of that. Let's continue to read. Scripture, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Verse 22, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what should I choose? I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between two, having a desire to depart, to be with Christ. See, he wants to suffer. No one likes to suffer, folks. Let's, let's face it. To be in a prison cell and to have all these difficulties, no one wants that. The Bible also says, the Apostle Paul writes, he says, we are groaning for the adoption of we're waiting. All creation's groaning for its redemption. So there's something in us that says, this is not heaven yet. And I want to let you know that this is not heaven yet. He hadn't discovered that yet. The world's not perfect. And the apostle Paul said, I'm hard pressed. Between the two, having a desire to depart to be the Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you for all the progress of your joy and faith. Now, what the Apostle Paul is basically saying, for those of you who have kids or have responsibility for children, if you're a guardian, you know how it feels? I, I mean, I always wanted to be on the planet and take care of things and make a difference, but it, it went up like a whole nother level when I had children. When Luke was born, Matthew and Hannah, when and they're on our life right now, I, have, I, I don't want to leave the planet. I, I want to make sure that I do all I can to help them become the men and a woman of God that they're called to be. I want to be there for them. I want to help them through the different stages in life. And, uh, and I want to help them. It's my desire. And, and it really it helps me stay on the planet. I want to be here for them. So if God says, I want to take you to heaven, God, please, I want to be there for my family. You know what I'm talking about? Well, this is the kind of love the apostle Paul had for the church. He wanted to make sure that his children, his spiritual children, would grow up strong. And he had a great desire. And in fact, the Lord gave him the assurance that this was not quite his time yet. He says, what does he say? He says, in being confident of this, I know I shall remain and continue with you for all your progress of faith. Isn't it amazing that the Apostle Paul had a passion to be with Christ and a passion for the people that God loved? What a way to live. We're not called to live a life of mediocrity. We're not called to live a life of just vain pursuit. We should be living a life of passion because God is a God of passion. And God's plan is exciting, far from boring. People are boring, God's not. God has a plan and a wonderful plan for all of us together. So he goes on and talks about that. And then uh, jump into verse 27. That's what he says. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or when I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Like a good parent, the apostle Paul wants everyone to get along, lets the kids to get along. That's a big desire. He understands the power of unity, of working together. So he goes on with that. Then he goes on in verse 29. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, listen to this, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict you saw in me, and that was in me. So the privilege to suffer for Christ. How many people want to suffer for Christ? 
Let's sign up right now. I'm going to ask them to bring the, 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 the clipboards out. Let's all sign up to suffer for Christ. No one wants to suffer for Christ. Right? Who wants to suffer? Who wants to go through pain? Who wants to be in a prison cell? Who wants to see family members killed? My friends, this has been going on throughout history. It's going on right now as we speak. There, there are Ukrainian refugees. There are Iranians are being persecuted. Saeed is being persecuted. We see people in, I, in Iran that are, have fled up to the Kurds up in the northern part of, of Iran to get away from persecution. We heard what happened to the 21 Coptic Christians. Their heads were, they were beheaded. Who wants, to, who wants to go through that kind of persecution? It's not something you would naturally do, but in, in, in the Fox Books of the Martyr, what a great book to read, and also Richard Wormwood, Tortured for Christ, it talks about how these people had joy in the midst of these horrible sets of circumstances. In fact, I was, uh, my wife was uh, sh- looking uh, through the internet, reading about these Coptic Christians in Egypt. And by the way, they were Christians. They were not Egyptian citizens only. Uh, they were Christians, and the reason they were killed was not because they were from Egypt. They were killed because they were Christians. And there were Islamists that did it, radical Islamists. Okay? And it's very important we understand that. It is they said, we're going to go march to Rome next. So it was not some kind of political thing. It was a religious holy war. It's a jihad moment for the, for the I'm sorry, for these radical Islamists. That's what it's for. And make no mistake, these people died not because they were Egyptians. They died because they were Christians, and they refused to deny their faith. And so um, my wife found this interview. We watched it together. I was going to show it, but it, was kind of, it, was, it wasn't in a great quality, so I was just going to share with you some of the quotes that happened. Bershil Kamel, brother of the two Coptic Christians beheaded by Isa in Libya, called a TV show on February 18th and said, the, you can go on the YouTube and see it, by the way. Don't do it right now, though. And said he thanks ISIS for keeping the Christians' last words because the last words of his brothers were this. Lord Jesus Christ was the last words they said just before their heads were, before they were beheaded. He says the following, he says this. He says, in their brutal video, because ISIS, I quote, strengthened their faith in our faith. This is what he said. And he continues to say, he says, uh, this is what he says. Since the Roman era, Christians have been martyred and have learned to handle everything that comes our way, says Bashir. I continue on with the quote. This only makes us stronger in our faith because the Bible told us to love our enemies and bless those who curse us. He says, I am proud of them. Bashir Camel said the following. He said that um, of his murdered brothers, he was 25 years old, I'm not quite sure if I'm saying this correctly, so I'm sorry. But Bishor uh, Estefanas and Kamel, the 23-year-old Samuel Estefanas Kamel, they take pride to Christianity, and they are my pride too, he says. What an incredible thing. He says God has blessed them. He says we're privileged to suffer for Christ. They're proud of their brothers. Can you imagine such a thing? In fact, he even says his mother is proud of their sons, and they have a love for these radical Islamists. At the same time, they say there should be political action done against them to stop this, but at the same time, they're doing it in a way of love. So we love these people. We hope they come to Christ. Isn't it amazing? I mean, how can you say and they don't have that kind of hatred in their lives? They have a love. Now, I, I think I, I'm not in a set of circumstances like that. Neither are you. And so how will we react in a situation like that? I don't know for sure, but I'll tell you one thing we can do. We can prepare ourselves because, you know, the Bible says those who follow Christ will be persecuted. It's a promise. Isn't that great? Gee, I want to be, in America, we might be persecuted by being the butt of a joke. Uh, you might, but it's not like it is in Iran. We have some Iranian refugees, Marguerite and Darius and their family, they understand what it's like. Their church was closed because uh, they won't let them even have church anymore. Where the people are being persecuted and make up stories. And you'll have someone say, what happened to John? Our friend John. Oh, he was in an auto accident and died. But you know it was a hit that was upon, upon their life. A lot of persecution. We don't experience it here in America right now. But make, make no mistake, this, is, this could very well happen in our lifetimes. 
And so what's the secret of this joy? How do you have joy in the midst of difficult circumstances? Maybe none of you are in prison, but perhaps you're in prison in your emotional state. So perhaps you're prison in your relationship where there's like no hope for your marriage. You're just, you're just going through it for the kids. And once they're gone, you, maybe you go get a divorce. Or maybe you know it's wrong to get a divorce. And you're just going to grit and bear it. And your marriage is lousy. Or maybe there's a situation at work that's not going well. Maybe there's a situation with your health. And you feel imprisoned under your circumstances. And you're wondering, how can I find joy? When this does this, then I'll be happy. When this happens, then I'll be happy. Remember, we mentioned last week that joy is a choice. Happiness is based upon happenstance. And basically, the difference is this. Joy is setting a thermostat to the heavens at temperature, while a happiness is a thermometer that's up and down like a yo-yo. The question is, how do you and I want to live? And I would advise in these moments of peace that we have in our society that we exercise and grow strong in our joy muscles for Christ. Because we don't know what's going to happen. The truth be told, if some of you are coming out of a crisis right now, maybe you came out of a crisis, you lost a job, got a new job. Maybe some of you are in the middle of a crisis right now, and some of you are going to go into a crisis. You might say, that's not very positive. Be more positive. I'm positive that you will have a crisis in your life. Why? Because this is the planet Earth. Things are not perfect yet. So how do we, what's the secret of this joy? Well, the apostle Paul talks about it. What does he say? In Philippians 2, now 1 through 11, we're coming to the secret here. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy. Here again, fulfill my joy. How can he fulfill his joy? He has a joy of hope that he's going to see this happen. He says, fulfill it now. This is my hope for you. I'm joyful that you'll reach this, but now make it happen. So in other words, this is something else about joy. Joy takes faith. Let me say it again. Joy takes faith because you're having joy for something that has not happened yet. The Bible says so clearly, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For we must believe he exists and he is a rewarder for those who diligently seek him. My friends, joy takes faith. Happiness takes circumstances. And sometimes you have to plant your joy ahead of what you're experiencing. And so it says, fulfill my joy, verse 2, being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Does it seem like everything that's done in society is through selfish ambition and conceit? He's saying that nothing be done from that. And by the way, do you know what's a, you know what's a joy killer? Living for yourself is a joy killer. What begins to happen is like an insatiable appetite to do something. I heard this story a number of years ago. I don't know if it's true, but it makes a good illustration. I heard that the Nordic uh, indigenous people, can't call them Eskimos, but the Nordic indigenous people, in order to kill a polar bear, you know what they, know what they do? That's just what I heard they did. They get a sharp spear, razor sharp, and they put herring on it, fish, and they freeze it. And so these polar bears will come and smell it and lick it, and they'll begin to lick that, that spike. And as they lick the spike, it slices their tongues open. The, the blood begins to uh, freeze right on the stick, and they taste blood, and they keep licking it, and they bleed themselves to death. My friends, living for yourself is like doing that. It does not work. You are not designed to live for yourself in your own happiness because it's like self-cannibalization. It's not even a word. I just made it up. Self-cannibalization is when you try to make yourself happy, you're eating the very thing you're standing on. It does not work. Living for yourself is temporary. It's a, it's a narcissistic way to live. It does not work. The Apostle Paul talks about that right here. and He, just, he has the authority to say this. Let nothing be done for self as an ambition and conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. I've tried to have an argument with somebody when I thought they were hired. I, I try to give them the benefit of the doubt, try to be nice to someone. Try. Next time you're getting irritated with somebody, okay, regard them higher than you and take the lowly, lowly position and try to have an argument. It's hard to do. Try it. You'll be unsuccessful. It doesn't work. What happens? How, how dare they? Ba, 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 right? 
And you start getting that type of thing. You, or you, you don't listen to somebody else. You're just looking for a way to kind of counterpunch. You're waiting for them to say something. You're going to offend you. I'm ready to go. And we lose the opportunity for peace. So right here in verse four, let each of you look not only for his own interests, but the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which, well, here's the key of it all. Here's the key of it all. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. This is the answer. Basically, if you want to have joy, you must learn to have the mindset that Jesus had. If you have the mindset Jesus has, you'll rise up to God's altitude of living. And that's the way to live. Why? Because you and I are living on a faulty operating system. We've been taught by our flesh. It takes no, it takes no skill or training to be selfish. Does it? Think about it. I mean, all of us have a PhD in selfishness. Many of us have many dissertations. We, we, I mean, you don't have to train someone selfishness 101. You, you don't have to train anyone in that. It comes naturally. And I hear today people are saying, well, I can't help it. It's just my nature. It's natural. You're born with this propensity. And now we're saying, celebrate who you are. You're natural. And so I even heard people say that being a criminal is in your genetics. And so we really can't hold, I, I'm, I've heard this and I've read about this. We really can't hold these people uh, and liable for that because they're born that way. They can't help it. Everything is a condition of genetic code instead of personal responsibility. Well, they're born an alcoholic. They can't help it. They're born that way. They can't help it. And we see that happening from many different types of behavior. It may be true that we may have a propensity. I have a propensity to be angry. I have a propensity to sleep and not get up. I have a propensity to be selfish. Does it mean you give in to it? No, we have to go against that narcissistic, narcissistic way of living and move beyond it. And this is what the Apostle Paul is saying. Let this mind be in you. Let this attitude be in which is also in Christ. Christ's attitude will bring you to God's altitude. We have to set our mind on Christ. And what did Christ do? This is one of the most important chapters in the Bible. If you want to become familiar with the Bible, I highly encourage you to become familiar with Philippians chapter two because it basically gives us the job description of how we are to have our attitude like. And when you're in a crisis or if you're upset with somebody else or you're going through a difficult set of circumstances, I encourage you to read Philippians chapter two and apply it to your spouse, apply it to your friend, apply it to your parent, but try it to your boss and see if you match up to what it's saying. Well, what does it say? Well, let's go ahead and read it. Let this mind, let this attitude, it's an attitude. An attitude determines your altitude. If you have a low attitude, it really does. Your attitude, it's your mindset. The mindset is so important. We've been taught by a lot of self-help gurus today. It's all about self, and you have to get yourself happy, and you have to think, and, and all that is, unfortunately, it's all feeding on yourself, and eventually you're, you become a self-cannibal, and you eat out your own strength. How can you rise above yourself if you're relying on yourself? You can't. It's like pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. I can, uh, I'm gonna pull my, you can't pull yourself up. And yet, humanism teaches us to pull ourselves up by ourselves. It does not work. We need a source higher than ourselves, and that's God Almighty. So the Bible continues to say here, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God. What does that mean? This is what it means. Jesus was not just a great prophet. He was not a great teacher. Jesus was and is God. The Bible makes no bones about it. You can see it in the book of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus is God. And so what Jesus did is he did not, he, what does it say? Look right here. It's amazing. It says, being in the form of God, did not consider robber to be equal with God. He's equal to God, but, 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 made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. So Jesus left his heavenly throne, voluntarily laid down his rights, his power, his majesty, and said, I'm laying it all down, and I'm going to be in human form, and I'm even going to become a baby. I'm going to have to rely upon my mom and my dad. I'm going to have to grow up and, and, and be subjective to my parents' counsel and their parenthood. I'm going to have to learn by obedience how to live. 
An amazing thing. You see, you and I screwed up. Humanity screwed up. So Christ came to show us the right way to do it. And he is the bridge that gives us the ability to do what God has asked us to do. It's through Christ and Christ alone that we can become what God's called us to become. Without Christ, you are never going to reach what you're called to be ultimately. Just impossible. That's kind of arrogant. Well, the truth is the truth, no matter what you say about it. Christ is the only way to be perfect with God. There is no other way to be saved. No no other way to get it right. Aren't you glad you don't have to go through all these things? I gotta do this, 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 and the other. No, we have to give our life to Christ, and then guys, God will, Jesus will bring us to God. That's how it works. So, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, a slave, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, as a result of him going low, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name, the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord of the glory of the Father What does that mean? He lowered himself so God raised him up. My friends, if you want to rise and be somebody in this planet, you want to be somebody in the kingdom of heaven, if you lower yourself, now lowering yourself does not mean you have a bad opinion of yourself. It doesn't mean you beat yourself up. What's going on? Oh, stupid me. I never get anything right. What are you doing? Oh, I'm humbling myself. No, you're being stupid. You're made in the image of God, and you have a great value to God. You don't say that. But you understand that without God, you can do nothing of value. But with God, you can do all things. So here's the key. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. It's found in verse 5. Let this mind be in you. Now listen to this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. This is very important. This is the crux of how to understand real biblical joy. And uh, in Hebrews 12, uh, verse 2, it says this. It says the following. Look unto Jesus, our author and completer of our faith. The author of our faith is Jesus. Why? He's the first prototype of what you and I are called to be like. He is the, he's the way maker. All right? Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, this is the key, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Do you know what kept Jesus on the cross? It wasn't the nails. It was joy. Joy kept him on the cross. Joy was the thing that was before him that gave him the power to endure. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. How are you and I going to endure what's going to happen in our lives? Only by the joy set before us. If you've given your life to Christ, knowing that this is not all there is, there's heaven, there's a better place coming that forever and ever and ever and ever will be with peace with God and, and be with God. And I mentioned uh, during the summer, I had a sermon series and I showed you a rope and I showed a little piece of red uh, part of the rope and I said, this is the part that represents this life and I showed you like a 30 foot rope, this is the rest of it. And so everything right now is, is, is nothing in comparison to eternity. You'd say, well, come on. You guys are typical Christians, uh, so heavenly minded, no earthly good. The truth of the matter is, the people that had the most significance of the planet are the ones that saw from a far off place. They had their self planted in heaven. You and I have to throw our anchor into heaven. We have to keep our eyes to heaven. That is our strength. That means no matter what you and I face, we need to cultivate the joy in our relationship with God. And I I encourage us to do that because you don't know what's going to happen in this planet. I don't know if you realize this. It wouldn't take much for another world war to take place. It seems like no one has the courage to stand up to evil at this current time in our our society. It's it's scary. But what's going to what would happen if um, what would happen if Russia went over? What would happen if Iran bombed Israel? What would happen? Who who's to say? Would another world war happen? What would happen if a nuclear war uh, happened and and a nuclear bomb went off? What would happen if a natural calamity took place and there's chaos in the world? And someone raises up and says, I can fix it for you. Come, elect me. I'm a fixer. And I'm going to bring peace. Hey, we want peace. 
The next thing you know, we have one world government. It doesn't take much, folks. It does not take much. Never in the history of man have we been able to collectively uh, be under one power in the world like we are right now. Am I saying it's going to happen? I don't know. I could say it's going to happen and write some books and make a lot of money, but I refuse to do that. I don't know what's going to happen, but I will tell you this. We should be ready. And we have the ability right now to practice our joy, to plant our joy in what Christ has for us. Now, what's a joy killer? I tell you, you want to know what a joy killer is? You want to have joy? One of the joy killers is living to impress other people. Or living for yourself is the first one. Living for yourself. I tell you, self cannibalization It doesn't work. Or how about living to impress people? How many of you ever heard of selfies? In 2013, it was the number one uh, word used. This year, 2014, you know what it was? It was the emo of the heart. And the second one was the hashtag. But before that, in 2013, it was, it was, uh, it was called selfie. And I looked it up to find what a selfie actually is. It's a person taking a picture of themselves at arm's length, usually at an angle. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you a little selfie help here. If you take a selfie, if you're, if you're over 40 and you have a little bit of weight on you, do not take one from down here. You've got to bring it up high. <laughs> if you do it down here, you see this thing. That's why I grow a goatee, okay? I need to go to Ed's gym. Okay, so anyhow, what happens is you got to go up here like this. And you, I, I just laugh because I see, you know, and this is one of the definitions. It says this. A person taking a picture of themselves at arm's length. A person in a picture by themselves. A self-portrait of yourself, usually by teen girls. You want to be a girly man? <laughs> Take selfies. And, and what is a selfie? It's so funny. I see people all over the place. You know, always like these poses. And it scares me sometimes as I see people in their cars doing selfies. And I've seen a couple selfies of some of you. And you're, and you're in a car like, like that, you know, this kind of, you know, sucking in your cheeks to get your cheekbones out and all that. And what's really scary is I saw a couple pictures of the, 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 the um, trees were a blur and they were, oh my gosh, they're doing what they're driving. So what's a selfie all about self? In fact, we become a very narcissistic society today. You and I have been trained since we've been babies to be narcissistic. Why? Because the advertising agencies need to make us selfish in order to sell product. You're always told what you do not have, and if you have this, then you'll be somebody. All you have to do is go to Stop and Shop and Stop to Your Drop, whatever, store, and all you have to do is go to the checkout line, and you see all these magazines with these airbrushed women and men, and they're sitting there looking perfect, and you're like, I, unless I become this, I won't be happy. Unless you drive this, unless you have this job, unless you have this money, we're told that if you do this, then you'll be happy. And as a result, we become a narcissistic people trying to achieve and trying to get something, trying to be like the other people on the block, trying to, you know, someone else does this. I'm amazed. My brother and his neighborhood, I shared this before, but my brother, uh, all of a sudden, my brother decided to put an in-ground pool, and he's, and he's the only one in the whole block. Within three years, all his neighbors had in-ground pools. Why? And they, and they were better than his. One put a slide. The other guy put a slide and a diving board. I mean, it just goes on and on. One guy had a deck. One guy has a double deck. So, you know, we try to outdo each other. We're, it's all about impressing and trying to be somebody. And I got to be somebody. I got to be somebody. And it's, it's a joy killer trying to impress people, trying to be, uh, you know, trying to look good, trying to be a selfie. How about we become selfless? You know how you can become the greatest person possible? When it comes about God instead. Otherwise, everything you have is based upon what you can achieve. That's scary. You're a finite being. You're imperfect, and one day you're going to die. Why would I build myself on myself? You have to build your life on something greater than yourself, and that's God. So that's one of the things. Living for the applause of men and women. You know, having it your way. Having it your way. Doing what comes naturally. Well, you know, he, he's just that way, and he can't help it. You know, it's all right. It's just natural for him to do it that way. I was born that way. You know, we can't live by our passions. We must live by the truth, and we must live by the joy set before us through Christ Jesus. That's one of the ways we do it. What did Jesus say? He said this, whoever wants to be the greatest must be the servant of all. Greatness and happiness comes through servanthood. Now, I want you to think, get nostalgic with me a, bit, a little bit. I want you to think back to some times in your life 
that you have actually did something for somebody else and no one else knew except for you and God, but you did something good. Maybe you sent someone some money anonymously that needed it. Maybe you helped someone else with something. Maybe you paid their bill or something like that. They didn't know who did it. How many of you can remember what you felt like when you did that? I can tell you that when I do things in secret and don't tell you, or my wife, or anyone for that matter, and I do it just to bless somebody, there is a sense of joy and fullness that I don't have in any other thing I do. Now, I want you to think back. I want you to think back. Maybe you did something that was totally selfless, and you did it with no one knowing, but you did it to benefit someone else. Tell me how you felt inside. You felt good. Well, isn't that being selfish because you want to feel good? No. Because God has designed us to be a blessing to other people. And when we are, we find who we are. Why? Because we become like Christ. When you begin to love God, if you love God, you'll love people. You want to help people. And this is the key, is being a servant. The key to joy is, of course, giving your life to Christ. The second key to joy is finding your joy in Christ, knowing who you are in Christ, and and, and meditating on who you're going to be in Christ. How does that happen? It happens by spending time with God. And his people. Whoever wants to be the greatest must be the servant of all. I'm going to ask the ushers to get ready. In Philippians 2, 12 and 13, the Bible says this. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, as in my presence, not only more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So we're supposed to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't sound very good. It sounds like works-based. I'm supposed to work out? Well, let's continue to read. Let's go back and, and hit reverse a little bit and go back to chapter one. Uh, Philippians 1, 6 says the following. It says the following. Being confident of this thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. Okay? God began a good new, God put something in you. And what does it say? It says he who has begun a good work will complete it in Christ Jesus. Then you jump over to Philippians 2.12, which is directly tied to that scripture, it says this. It says, work out your salvation. So we must work out what God's put in us. Do you see that? You work out what God has put in you. That's our job. God has put his spirit in us. He's given us a reservoir. He's given us a river. Imagine a desert place where there's no running water and God is, and someone installs a sprinkler system within the center of the, of the land and it sprays all around where the seeds are. It's coming from within that it works out and brings up a crop. My friends, the glory of it is this. You find God by, by letting God come in you. The Bible says out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. It, you don't have to look in to find God, you look in because God is in you if you give your life to him. And if you do that, you can begin to work out what God has placed in you. That's the key to life. So with fear and trembling, when you hear God speak and says, I want you to do this, you must listen to the voice of God. When you feel like doing something good for somebody, it's God speaking to you. So we have to work out what God has put in us. You don't work for your salvation. You can't but you can work out what God's placed in you. And that gives us more joy because we're designed to be that way. And when we fulfill the design that God has made us, it brings joy. Why? Because everything begins to reverberate. Aha, this is what I've been created to do, to love God and love other people. That's what I've designed to do. And that gives you the greatest fulfillment that you could ever have. And it brings joy, unspeakable joy, beyond circumstances. So one day, if the doctor says to you, you have cancer, you're going to die, you can say, I thank God that I'm going to win this no matter what. That if you lose your job, you go, I, though I might have lost my job, I know that in Christ I'm overcomer. I know that one day I'll be with him forever and ever. And that gives me joy. This is temper. There may be tears at night, but joy comes in the morning because my destiny is not where I am. It's where I'm going in Christ. It gives you the strength to be over what you're experiencing. My friends, if we don't get a hold of this, because difficult times will come in our lives, you're not going to be ready. Why not be ready now? Why not change ourselves now by letting God change us from the inside out? We must work out what comes in. What does Paul say? Paul says, it's important also to partner with other people. The apostle Paul says, and and following in Philippians 2.20, about Timothy, he says this, for I have no one like-minded who would sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, 
not the things which are of Jesus Christ. But you know he has proven character that as a son with his father, he's served me with the gospel. See, Apostle Paul says, I got people that are betraying me, but I have a faithful friend in Timothy. Then he talks about Ephroditus later on in that same chapter. Uh, Ephroditus has been a help to him. The Apostle Paul worked with other people. He went out with Paul and Silas. Paul and Barnabas went out together, okay? He didn't, send, he didn't go out by himself. I want to encourage you that you need to get connected to other believers and encourage each other. We're not called to do this by ourselves. We work with God and we work with each other, which is called the body of Christ. What's the answer to all this? Well, the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 6, therefore, humble yourselves, under the mighty hand of God, that he will exalt you. Yes, that's going to make his way up as well. I want to conclude our time here before we have communion together. It's the following. Uh, I told you the story about the ISIS Coptic Christians. And Bashir said, this is what he said about his mother and about how they handled this loss of life of their brothers. He said this, asked Bashir if he would forgive the members of ISIS that murdered his brothers. Bashir said, he asked the same question of his mother, who replied when she saw the murders. She actually saw the video. Can you imagine seeing your child being beheaded on video? She saw the video. And she said, this is what she said. She would invite them to their home because he was the reason her sons entered the kingdom of heaven. My mother, he, I quote, an uneducated woman in her 60s said she would ask him to enter her house and ask God to open his eyes because he was the reason her sons entered the kingdom of heaven. He concluded his call by praying for the men who killed his brothers. And this is what he likes to quote. Dear God, please open their eyes to be saved and quit their ignorance and the wrong teachings they were taught. My friends, what an amazing love, a joy that not even circumstances have control over us. How would you like to cut away all these things that control us? So many of us are yo-yos, Christians. Well, the enemy has us in the palm of his hand, and we're based upon circumstances. You want to get that string off the enemy's finger? Put it on God's hand. Get that string off. I'm not going to base it upon on this earth. I'm going to place my anchor on Jesus Christ and who I am in Christ. My friend, that guarantees you a joy that's beyond circumstances. My friends, we need to cultivate this joy because this is what real joy is. Joy, unspeakable joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We need to find that joy together. But that joy can only happen through forgiveness. I'm going to ask you to pass out the elements, please. Can you imagine forgiving someone that killed your child? I can't imagine it. I pray to God I never have to face a, a scenario like that where I'm tested. I really do. God, please. But imagine this mother being able to say, I forgive this person for doing this. Isn't that amazing? Has anyone killed your loved ones? Maybe some of you are holding bitterness against a spouse, an ex-spouse, your children, your mother, your father, perhaps someone at work, someone in the past, 30 years ago, you haven't spoken to someone. Has anyone chopped off the head of your loved ones? Has anyone killed? No. Listen, unless we forgive, God won't forgive us. I'm just quoting what it says in the Bible. Jesus said, right after the Lord's Prayer, he says, he tells us to pray this way, God, forgive me like I forgive others. And then he says, two verses later in Matthew, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart, God will not forgive you. Forgiveness is essential for joy because forgiveness is the key, one of the keys to joy. The, the, the issue is this. Some of you are thinking, I can't do all that. Well, neither can I. I'm, I'm just glad to tell you today, we don't have to do all these things. What we have to do is surrender and say, God, I give my life to you through Jesus Christ. That's the answer. And so I don't know where you are today. I don't, you may be coming to church. You may know about the Bible. You may have grown up in a, in, a, in a Christian school. I don't know. But have you ever surrendered your life to Christ and say, God, it's not about me anymore. It's about you. I give my life to you today. I am no longer the boss. I hand you the keys. You're the boss of my life. I'm not going to do it my way. I'm going to do it your way because you know best and I trust you. Have you ever done that in your life? Maybe you've done it in the past and you took control again or maybe you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. Truth of the matter is you can never be good enough. Neither can I. 
It's a vain pursuit. You can never be good enough, but Christ is good enough for us. We have to receive what he's done for us. He gives us what we cannot do ourselves. He's paid a, a trillion dollar debt that you and I can never pay. And all we have to do is say, I receive what you've done for me. And so I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and, and a reverence for other people. I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you pray this prayer with your heart, I believe you'll begin a new day with the Lord. Real simple. Lord Jesus, I thank you. You can pray quietly, just repeat it in your own words when you hear me pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you that you have paid the price of all of my sins, both past and present, that I can come to you, and because of what you've done for me, I can have access to you and God. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown, and I choose this day to turn away from what I know is wrong. Fill me with your strength that I could walk the path that you have before me in Jesus' name. I give my life to you today. I declare that you are God and I'm not. I will listen to you and I will fulfill your design by your power and by your strength in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, uh, they're having cards in your bolt. You can fill it out or come up afterwards. At this time, what we want to do is we want to take communion. And Jesus was broken that we could be whole. By his broken body. This represents the body of Christ, which was broken for you. Take all of you, eat. What washes away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus said this, do this in remembrance of me. I will not drink of the wine till I go to my Father's house. You realize that one day, all this will be complete. One day, Christ will come back. One day, it will be complete. It says, do this in remembrance of me. It's all about what Christ has forgiven us. We need to forgive each other. I want to encourage you to, to do an inventory. Is there anyone you have not forgiven? You need to forgive them because Christ has forgiven you. The Bible says, if you don't forgive your brother, I won't forgive you. The Bible also says in 1 Corinthians that some of you have gotten sick and even died because you have, dis, you have defamed the body of Christ by not forgiving each other. That's a serious thing. None of us are good enough, my friends. When you realize that, it sets you free to have real joy and real forgiveness. Take drink, everybody. I'm going to ask Esteban to have a closing song. If we could, we could all stand. I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way up. If you would like to receive prayer for anything at all, we want to pray with you. We want to ask that you would walk straight. Let me just, let me just pray one final prayer. Why don't you all stand if you could? We're going to conclude in a minute. Let me just pray right now for you. Father, we want to be a people of joy. We want to have that unspeakable joy. And so, Father, we together, collectively, whether we're watching by video or, or here right now, we say we want to have your joy. Father, we thank you that if we are in you, the best days are ahead for us. Lord, for the joy set before us, we know that one day we're going to be in, in your presence with no inhibit, nothing inhibiting us at all. And we thank you for that promise in Christ Jesus. But, Lord, in the meantime... We pray that we would use that joy to propel us to be the men and women you've called us to become. I ask God that you would give us a joy beyond ourselves as we serve you, as we serve each other, and as we serve your purposes here on the planet. I pray, God, for passion for you and passion for your work in Jesus' name. I ask for your joy to overcome us in every set of circumstances. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being attentive. Let's have one closing song and prayer team. Please make your way up. At 145, we have um, uh, 101 Church, if you want to go. God bless you. Love that fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love that never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love that never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me.